my people today I have bring to thee that of my presence that I might cause thy spirits to be refreshed that thou might become acquainted with the reality that as thou come from time to time to this place that I have ordained I will cause the light to shine upon thy life and upon thy pathway yea many times there will be questions in thy heart and thou wilt ponder them for days upon end but I say unto thee there shall not be a question in thy mind but when I the Lord thy God will cause it to come about in time to come thy answer will be granted and thou will see more clearly of the what has been contained in that of my written word down to the centuries of time when men have saw a little glimpse of reality yet they spoke it in a mystery I say to thee all these things will come to light and thou will see the light and thou will walk in the light for I am the Lord thy God who is thy light says the Lord beyond this morning but we're going to go on it from an altogether different standpoint the title of it will be the three phases of the first resurrection you know the resurrection which we know is the dead raising from out of the ground. It's been a thing that man from time beginning has contemplated, wondered what would it be all like and how would it come about. And there's no one generation that has ever saw the full light meaning time when or how. But I'm going to ask you to, this morning to turn with me in the book of Job. Now according to the chronology of this writing, this occurs around 1520 years before the advent of Christ. I want to read to you what it says here about Job. There was a man in the land of Uz, U, capital U-Z. You might say, well, where is that land? Well, upstairs we have a large map of the world. What we see as the great land of Saudi Arabia today, it says on this map, the land of Uz, or Uz, how do you want to pronounce it? Job was of that area whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and issued or hated evil. Now, that was the introduction to this writing. And we know from the first of it to this 19th chapter, it gives you the background of Job, it gives you his family structure, his wife, his children, his son, his wealth. But somehow or other there comes a time that the devil comes up before the Lord. And he's asked the question, where have you been? He said, I've been going up and down through the earth sin, right in torment, create havoc with, you know. The Lord asked him, what do you think of my man Job down there? Well, he's a pretty good fellow, but then you've got a hedge about him. He says, nobody can get to him. Well, there's no need of me relating all the contest. But then we see when things go on. Why, Job becomes smitten with these stinking boils. He winds up sitting in ashes. And all of his friends that has knew him in his good days, they begin to come. And they begin to say, Job, what have you done wrong? Something's got to, you, you did something wrong, terrible. But they don't, none of them understand what is really going on. It's a contest between God and the devil. Because the devil says, you just take your hand off him and I'll show you what I can do with him. Well, that happens today also. It may not happen in similarity like this, but how many times, brothers and sisters, you start out by faith to walk this Christian life, it is as long as something happens. The devil just unloads on you, 
And it seems like sometimes it, it, it happens worse to some than it does to others. But that's according to what God has willed for it to be. But the contest is, Job is in his worst state of physical feelings and, and how he looked at to his friends. And in this 19th chapter, he sat no doubt for days on end, meditating, wondering. Lord, I just don't understand. But after he's been criticized, he's been condemned, Different things have been said to him. Finally we see that Job comes to the point. He begins to look ahead. And he says these words. Now 1,520 before the advent of Christ. That was even before the law was given. Oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book. That they were graven with an iron pen and lead in the rock, up for, rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer liveth. And that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Well, we're living now in the latter day. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me, meaning his whole physical being is ashes, gone back to dust. This is the first account, brothers and sisters, of such a thing, that we begin to see what patriarchs. Now some might ask the question, well, who was Job? He was not of the tribes of Israel. But when you go back to the 25th chapter of Genesis, here's where we begin to get a little insight. Here's where you have to begin to read between the lines and realize Job's got to be a descendant somewhere of Abraham's kindred line. In the 25th chapter of Genesis, Abraham has already reached old age. Then again, Abram took a wife, and her name was Keturah. And she bare him Zimran, and Jokshan, and Medan, and Midan. These are places named in Saudi Arabia today. And Ishbak, and Shua. And Jokshan begat Sheba, that's also named in Saudi Arabia. And Dedan, which is another place named in Saudi Arabia. And the sons of Dedan were Asherim, and Lechurim, and Lumimim. And the sons of Medan was Ephah, that's also mentioned in Saudi Arabia. And Ether, and Hanok, and Abidah, and Eldah. All these were the children. It says all these were the children of Keturah, but actually it was uh, the, the real wording of it would be, this is the real children of Keturah and her grandchildren. And Abram, notice now, Abram gave all that he had unto Isaac. That mean, means the, we will say, the substance of much of his riches. And while the Pope was in, uh, in Syria yesterday, I saw it in the news last night. The leader of Syria, he makes a little speech saying that it was the Jews that more or less humiliated and did away with Christ. What he was doing, he was trying to exalt the Christian faith, putting down the Jews, and he said, oh, that the God of heaven might reconcile the Muslims and the Christians together, and that one day this land would be given back over to the rightful owners, that Jerusalem would be theirs in the land. In other words, his idea was, do away with the Jews. That's the sum of it. But now as we go on here, <coughs> And he sent them away from Isaac, his son. And while he yet lived, he sent eastward into the east country, these other sons. Now the east country, when you would look at this map, it's all because it's all beyond the Jordan River. But we, we do know this, 
that the immediate area beyond the Jordan River is what makes up the country of Jordan today. Also, some of the tribes of Israel were settled over there. So he didn't send them over there because already Esau was over there. Already the sons of Lot by incest was over. Ammon and Moab, they were over there. But what it means here, he sent these sons eastward into the east country into a vast desert wilderness. And we have to believe them. Because somewhere these was all part of Abram's kindred, kindred line. And a church came out of the land of yours. That's that vast land in that part of the world. Somewhere, Ab I mean, somewhere then, Job is one of the descendants of these, one of these types of people. But he's one of them, we will say, his genes kicks back to that same that was in Abraham. And he had that revelation, which is a rarity among them, and there are people like that, but it did him. That's why it's written that far back. So by the time that these sons was all sent eastward, you've got, we will say in the proximity, you've got 300 and some odd years. So you can see they had an opportunity to generate themselves many times over, so that by the time then that the that the children of Israel in 1500 coming out of Egyptian bondage see the wilderness journey this man's teaching that has come in line with somebody because some words within the structure of the Jewish heritage they had to get a hold of this man's words we don't know much geography about it we don't know much history but when just looking between the lines he's got to be a descendant of Abraham from the other lines and he's got a revelation it just goes to show brothers and sisters that somewhere the same revelation, the same way that God dealt with Abraham, he's inherited through that line. Now then, this seems to be one of the first times we pick up about a resurrection. But it don't give no details. It don't put no specifics on it. And think of it. From that time on, then the children of Israel, it's through them we realize all these promises are going to be eventually, gradually, through process of time, be made known. It all goes to show. God don't give any one generation a full picture of the complete thing until we'll say somewhere we're coming to an end of whatever that is supposed to be pertaining to. So now then, when we come to Isaiah then, we will pick that up. Isaiah the 26th chapter. The writings of Isaiah were somewhere around 712 B.C. before the advent of Christ. And we can say it's a little better than 800 years after the writings of Job. The prophet Isaiah, in our English translation, words it like this. But in the Hebrew to English, I'm going to do my best to try to convey the thought the way the Hebrew would convey it. I'm starting in the 19th verse of the 26th chapter of Isaiah. Thy dead man, men, shall live together with my dead body. Shall they arise? Awake and sing, ye that dwell in dust. For that dew is as the dew of herbs. And the earth shall cast out the dead. Now, <clears throat> verses 20. Come, my people, enter thou unto thy chambers, and shut the doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment. This is as close we can come to something other that would even indicate something like a secret rapture that's going to occur. And we've got charismatic preachers today that says there's no such thing in the Bible. Well, you stick around. Why does the book of Revelation speak of one group of people clothed in fine linen and another group clothed in white remnant? To me, that goes some, peop some people are colorblind. 
Or they have no understanding but the, the difference between what is white and merely just linen. The Bible wouldn't word it like that if there wasn't a meaning contained in it. All right. <clears throat> For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the wind in the last days. For their iniquity there is also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. So it's containing here a promise that the earth one day is going to give up the dead. And really that 19th verse is pertaining to the land of Israel where the dead Jewish people are at. Thy land. That's what it's really pertaining to. The Jewish people. So it's a promise. But yet it's without a lot of specifics. We can see that. Now when we go from that, brothers and sisters, we come on down then to the writings of Daniel. <clears throat> In the 12th chapter of Daniel, we're 200 years after Isaiah. And from this is why the Jews today look for a general resurrection. Which means there's just one big resurrection coming, but everybody that's dead will come alive. So here in the first verse of Daniel chapter 12, and at that time, when? Somewhere in the end time, because you, when you read the 11th chapter, you get the setting at the end time. Shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, which is Israel? For there shall be a time of trouble, and it is already started. This don't just all pertain to the tribulation period itself. It means economics, political, and domestic. This situation in the Middle East, brothers and sisters, just because we sit here in America, secure in our little habitations of luxury, air-conditioned, neighborhoods, protected, we take for granted that everybody else in the world is living like that. They're not. For seven months now, these Jewish people in these isolated villages where they have rebuilt them in them areas that were taken in the 67 war. To fulfill what Ezekiel said, that they would come back in the latter day and rebuild the ruined places. Well, that's what they've been doing since 67. But now the Arabs are harassing them, positioning themselves with sharp shooter rifles. And when anybody shows his head, they get shot at. Every day you read in the news, and I'll have to say it's sad that our CNN and ABC and NBC and CBS has all absolutely turned the back on Israel proper and they want to write about it in a negative manner as though it's all Israel's fault. Well, that goes to show they don't know nothing about what the Bible says. When the Jews try, then try to defend themselves, which they try to, then the whole world downs them. And it goes to show, brothers and sisters, some of our political leaders, they'll trot off to church some morning with the Bible under their arms as if they're very religious. They're not. They're going through a formality. No person, if that's all they've got, just to carry a book under their arm and trot off to a meeting place, that don't mean they're spiritual at all. They can be as blind and ignorant. They've got tradition in their minds. And they don't want nothing to tear that up. So we can say this this morning. The Jews, as I said, they look for more or less a general resurrection. So I'll finish reading this. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time in the last latter days. And at that time, thy people, now he's talking about the children of Israel in this particular setting, thy people shall be delivered. When is that to be? In the 11th chapter of Revelation, it's in the first part of that week of Daniel, when the two prophets come on the scene. That's when those Jews spiritually will be revelated, sealed with the Holy Ghost, and realize that God has brought them back for, for, for the fulfillment of this. 
That people shall be delivered. Everyone that shall be found written in the book. And that's predestination. 100%. And this time of trouble. As that, that verse goes out into the first part of the week. And comes back and picks up another object of thought. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth. Shall awake. Notice now how it's worded. Some to everlasting life, and some to shame and contempt. And they that be wise shall shine. Now this is another category of people. It's not talking about the people that are dead that are wise. It's people that are alive that are wise. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Now all it said there, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall come forth, shall awake to everlasting life, and some to everlasting shame and contempt. That sounds like a general resurrection, doesn't it? That's why the Jews, in general, they believe in a general resurrection. Now let us move on just a little further, brothers and sisters. Let's go to St. John, the fifth chapter. Here is Jesus, the Savior, who is anointed by God. God speaking through him, leading him, guiding him, directing him to say the things that God wants to be said. And I have to say, brothers and sisters, we today are mortals. But we have to begin to understand one thing. God has a reason for just giving a little glimpse of something or other in one particular century of time. And it proves it right here. Daniel was written in 500 and something B.C. But here's the Lord Jesus Christ here speaking in the fifth chapter. And let's see what he says here now. Marvel not at this, it just it's reference what he has just said. For the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves. Now the word graves here means in the cemeteries. It's not talking about in the pews. It's not talking about spiritual graves. He talked about graveyards, tombstones, all that are in the graves shall hear his voice, and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, well that's almost what Daniel said, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. That's what Jesus said at that time. So again, are we saying that Jesus believed in a general resurrection? It looks that way. But we're going to see, the point was, the Heavenly Father did not inspire him with the full picture of things. And I say this, brothers and sisters, to show you the full revelation of whatever has been written from the Psalms right on down to the end did not come to the church until after the calling of the Apostle Paul and the Apostles who writes these things in our New Testament epistles. When we read them, brothers and sisters, it's not that they're contradicting Jesus nor contradicting the, the prophets. It's that God has instilled them with a revelation and an understanding how to take these things and divide them and put them in their respective place to be unfolded in time. We realize this, that God does things in threes when he's dealing in the realm of redemption. But when he's dealing in the realm of judgment, of ungodliness, he's got one blow he strikes the thing with. So if we can understand it in that manner, it sounds like here, yes, that Jesus is almost quoting Daniel 12. Giving the followers of him at, at that hour 
that this is the way the resurrection is going to be. But now then, brothers and sisters, I will say this this morning. There was a resurrection took place when Jesus rose from the tomb. It was obvious. We'll read about it in a moment, but I want to bring out this kind of a picture. The Jewish people today, I've been there, I've saw these tombs of the patriarchs, David, King David, and, and so forth. They look back to these tombs, and they mark them, and they, they, they treat them as something sacred. And I hope that I can say this, not in any way to create a negative image of the Jew himself. But the point I'm trying to express is, in reality there's nothing sacred about that tomb. The place where Jesus was laying and rose from the dead and the angels came down and rolled the stone. That's not a sacred spot. Something sacred was involved, but he's no longer there. It's just the same old hole in the rock. Same old with these places that the Jewish people. They, that's why Jesus said, you've garnished the tomb to the prophets and so forth. But they rebuked them for actually living and thinking like they, they did. So when you go there today, oh yes, to that King David still there. And they say, but his tomb is with us today. Sure, the tomb is there. Amen. But I have to say, brothers and sisters, his bones ain't even in there no more. Amen. And the reason I say this, brothers and sisters, is when we get to the end of the subject of what we're talking about, this is exactly why. It plainly is written in the book of Revelation, Blessed and holy is he that hath part. The word part means there's a place. For each and every person in the centuries and a lot of times, however God was dealing with mankind in that period, whether it's in the law age or the grace age. There's definitely in the plan of God a designated period of time that he deals with them. So blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. As of such the second death, which means the only thing that comes out of the ground in the second resurrection is dead. Death. Death and hell. <coughs> Give up the dead. Wicked people. From all time. One general resurrection for that. And was cast into the lake of fire. But now let us look, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> there are many scriptures throughout the Bible scattered. I want us to go this morning to one in particular, Psalms 110th. Down through the centuries of time, the prophets of old, here's David in the Psalms, the Spirit and the anointing of God comes down and inspires him to say certain things at a certain time. To the Jewish people, they sung them, but in them there is a prophecy, the 110th Psalm. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand. Until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Now is this a third party looking on while two other parties transit are in the transition of this business? That's not the picture. It's a prophecy. And what it is, brothers and sisters, Lord in the first sent, uh, setting of, obje of object of thought, is God, the Elohim, the Creator. He's the Heavenly Father of all creation. For by Him all things come into existence. That's the Lord Jehovah. He is the major object of worship. And you can't worship nothing beyond that, because there is no other God. There's no other Lord which is Master. But this Psalm, which is a prophecy, looking ahead to an appointed time, when God was going to bring forth His begotten Son, 
And at that time, brothers and sisters, get that Trinitarian thought completely thrown out in the trash. There was no such as the pre-existence of the Son of God. He only existed in the mind of God. And since he existed in the mind of God as a thought, that's why in the beginning was the Word. Because the translation in John's Gospel, brothers and sisters, in the beginning was the memory, the expression of God's thoughts. And you and I were chosen in Him before the foundation of the world, before there was truth and twinkle, a little star. God, omniscient, knowing all things. And let's see how many freckles you'd have on any of your nose. He knew whether you'd be red-headed, black-headed, blonde-headed, and so forth. I'm glad we serve a God like that. He knew all things. Nothing takes him by, uh, by surprise. It's man that winds up being surprised. And it's man that becomes startled. All right? So the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Now this is a prophecy. But let's look how the Apostle Paul begins to handle this. And we can take that, brothers and sisters, over into the writings of Hebrews. So let's turn there to the book of Hebrews. And, the, and we're going to read here where certain things was contained in the Psalms. Paul here in the first chapter, in the fifth verse we start. We want to get Paul's thought. Because brothers and sisters, in the New Testament, as he's writing to Hebrews, which means he's writing to Jewish believers somewhere, he's drawing the basis of this from the Psalms. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again I will be to him a father. Now, we've got to begin to realize this is how the Apostle Paul, hundreds of years later, begins to take these psalms and put them into the practical language of his hour. I will be to him a father. Well, that's what the Lord Jehovah was. And he shall be to me a son. That's the one that was made to be Lord and Savior to you and me. And so we could call him, he's my Lord, but he's our Savior. Amen. He's not the creator of the universe. He's not the creator of the earth you live on. He's not the creator of your being. Your Heavenly Father, the Lord and Master of the universe. Amen. And the inspiration that has caused men to write these prophecies and these things through time, it was the Spirit of the Lord, Jehovah, the Elohim, the Great I Am, coming down and anointing mortal man. And then man speaks through the inspiration, giving forth these things. But at the time when they were written, when they sung them, did they understand it? No. It was hid. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten. Now you can see how Paul then could write Romans 8, 28. Get to the girl, he says, and let all the angels of God worship him. Yeah. Like we had one character come through here, brothers and sisters. Well, after he left here, he went into Canada. He told them, you only worship the spirit. That's nonsense. You worship the whole person that he was. Because if angels was to worship him, they'll worship an object that can be seen. Not an invisible thing. Because the flesh itself was holy. Now let us look at him in this sense. When we preach the Godhead the way we do, the someone said, well, you take away the divinity. I do not. If he was the Son of God, his life came from the very being and the source that the Father was. If God's divine, what does that make the Son's spirit life? It's divine also. Your life, genetically, your sex life, that determines who you are. It came from your father. And today they talk about DNA. You know what DNA cells spelled backwards? And. That's right. And. What else? <laughs> They're going to run into that and one of these days. They're going to run into him. 
All right. And of the angel he says he makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. Now then, we've said enough that there's more that could, that could go with it. But let's go back, brothers and sisters, to 1 Corinthians. And here's what I have to say, brothers and sisters. When God called Paul a Jew and gave him a revelation of his plan of grace to the Gentile nations who had been pagans, drinkers of blood, eaters of flesh offered to devils, feasting on things of that diabolical nature. Many of the Jews couldn't understand how the grace of God could bypass the law and come down to a bunch of heathens and give them the same spirit that he had gave the Jews in the upper room. And I have to believe, brothers, to a great extent, that's why a lot of them today wondered, why did us Gentiles accept Jesus as our Messiah and Savior when their ancestors didn't? Well, we can say this looking back on time. They did not have a revelation. And yet it's all written up in the Torah. Little words written in the Torah, brothers and sisters, they observed them to the little point. But they couldn't see the types and the shadows contained in it. That pointed ahead, not backwards. And when I get responses from them in regards to some of the things we say over there, I send over there, they're thinking this far. But every once in a while, there are certain things we, they, they remind that certain of the Jewish realm, they throw at them. Well, we believe in keeping the law. And then we believe in seeing Jesus as our Messiah. You can't mix the two together. They don't go that way. Paul rebuked men in that day for trying to mix the thing up. And I have to say this morning, we ought to, as Gentiles, thank God for our spirit of revelation that takes our old dumb mind and penetrates it and gives us a little picture of what has been written. And we can look ahead, not backwards all the time. What has been? What has been? What has been? It's what's going to be. Yes, he was not there. But he's still the same today. He's a God of revelation. He's a God of understanding. He's a God that can lead you and direct you. But if we walk backwards, brothers and sisters, that's where people are going to miss. Tradition, tradition, tradition. Why, well, you can fly a tradition up and bow, wrap bouquets around it. And, and brothers and sisters, you can spend your lifetime looking backwards at things. Don't you do your one bit of good. So when Paul here is speaking to the Corinthians, there had been something come up that caused some of the Corinthian pagans they were. Yes, pagans they were. I've been in the rooms at old city Corinth. Goodness sakes alive. And you see some of them pagan temples. One worship at that, one worship at that, one worship at that. But keep in mind, some of Paul's first converts was Jews that was in that city Corinth. And that's why God told Paul, be patient, I have many souls here. Now then, let's start in this 12th verse in 1 Corinthians. And here's where Paul begins to really explain how Psalms 110 works in its redemptive work. Now if Christ be preached, that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? So many pagans back then, though they have been converted to Christ, they still look back. I don't understand. I can't see it. It's impossible. And brothers and sisters, we've got theologians in our denominational realm today that preach the same thing. I've read it. You can get it in printouts on the email. They absolutely, brothers and sisters, are saying today, there is no scientific proof that there was a man that raised from the dead. And then here the other day, brothers and sisters, in another paper that I got, a Jewish rabbi who didn't claim to be, we will say, a Messianic believer. But he says, looking at the scriptures and looking at the history, he says it is a must that the faith that the New Testament writings was written about, built upon, he said the man had to rise from the dead. And it's not impossible. So but take a Jew like that, brother and sister, to repudiate some of these Gentile doctors of divinity. I have to say, I'd be ashamed myself to claim I'd be, that I'm a Christian 
a follower of a man. And yet I deny that, yes, that even deny that he was born a virgin birth. Well, you take all these interesting points out of the subject. I have to say, you just want to go get your daughter and go coon hunting. <laughs> now, how many knows what I meant by that? <laughs> the time you've lost would mean just as much. So, how say among some of you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Now Paul comes back. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? So he's taken the, the accusation and the thought and expressing it in this manner. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom you say, the Corinthians, that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. We have spent our time worthless on you, preaching to you. Then they also which have fallen asleep in Christ are perished. They're dead. Rotted away. No hope. That annuls everything. That joke even said. But now, present tense to him, is Christ risen from the dead. And became the first fruits of them that slept. Now, brothers and sisters, that takes you right back to the 23rd chapter of Leviticus. And here's what I said the Jews keep the Sabbath, they observe it to the letter. And on the Sabbath day, if they're strict, it means they keep well only so far, and then they got to just go back. Because the Sabbath restricts that. But notice in the 23rd chapter of Leviticus, the type that they should have been looking at, that when they come into the land, spring of the year has come, the farmers go out into the fields, and when the grain is getting just about ready to cut, they cut a sheaf, and they take the green twig and tie around it. That is a sheaf of grain. That's known as the first fruit of that crop. Not last year's, not next year, of that particular, this year's crop. And they bring that to the high priest at the temple. Now all over the land of Israel, there was farmer after farmer bringing these sheaves. What was to be done with them? The priest lays them up and I can just see them stacked there. So that then, when the Passover season would come, which would, would come just in a short order of time, because the harvest season and the Passover will occur relative much in the same period of time. Now, <clears throat> we see then how the, the, uh, the, the Sabbath is worded. Then during the, the Sabbath that falls in the Passover season, then the next day, which means tomorrow, the priest was to take that sheaf and wave it before the Lord. He was not to wave it on the fifth day of the Passover, nor the sixth day of the Passover, nor on the seventh day of the Passover. Because the seventh day will be the Sabbath of that period. He's to take that sheaf open and raise it on the morrow. Wave it. That's the eighth day. That typifies Christ's resurrection. When you read Matthew, Mark, and John. He did not raise on the Sabbath. And he did not rise on the evening when the Sabbath was over. Early in the morning. On the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the others. They had spices. They wanted to clean the body. They wanted to embalm it. But when they got there, they found it was empty. An angel asked them, How, Why seek you the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. Now the point is, the seven day at Adventist said, Well, I climb a tree. Well, I have to say, go ahead and climb a tree, my friend. You've had this thing for better than a hundred and some years, preaching the, the Jewish Sabbath. 
But you keep in mind, Jesus rose on the first day of the week to fulfill the type that was contained in the Passover. And then it follows them, my brothers and sisters. Then you will count unto you so many Sabbaths, seven Sabbaths, which actually covers a period of 49 days, plus then the seventh Sabbath within that structure. It's 50 days later. That's when the New Testament church was born in the upper room. On the first day of the week again, the Holy Ghost came. And brothers and sisters, it didn't come at midnight at night. Now don't tell me that it did. On the day of Pentecost had fully come. That meant the daylight hours. Here's has been on in the streets. The Jews. Keeping the ritual of the thing. They made two even rolls of bread. It's got to have leaven in it. And they're on their way from their abodes with these leaven rolls of bread. It types, brothers and sisters, you and me. It's also, also the first fruits of the beginning of God's plan of redemption. And they're on their way to the temple to give these to the priest and he's going to burn them, consume them. But the leaving in that bread types, the mortal flesh we live in, is still subject to sin. But that don't mean because you're a believer that you're still a sinner. You're not. But the flesh you live in is still subject to sin if you give into it. And so on that day when the church was born, let's try to look at the time it was. It was not midnight at night. I defy that. We've got some people, brothers and sisters, that want to scream in the night and swallow a camel. It reads in the book of Acts that when the day of Pentecost has come, they were all with one accord and sitting in the upper room. And all of a sudden there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. And of course we got the denominational world when they were scared to death. Well, if they heard one born in the floor squeak a little bit, what was that? There's nurse as jello is on a goat wagon. But when that, when that sound of that rushing mighty wind came in, right there the whole house. Can't you see this 120 sitting there? They've been sitting there for several days. Fulfilling exactly what Jesus said. And they're not going to leave because he said, you tell in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And so there they're sitting. Jesus never told them when you hear the wind blow or when you hear the door squeaking. He never told them one thing to listen for, but you tell it till you're being dude. And brother, when that house began to, we will say it, sound like a mighty wind. Then all of a sudden, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Yes, and I have to say, if they could stand in our midst today and begin to tell how they felt by being filled. Something would say what the first thing I felt. I begin to, I feel top heavy, dizzy, like I was drunk. And they were drunk. They were literally drunk on that new wine that Joel spoke about. Hear ye this, you men of Judea. And you're drinking some wine. For the new wine is cut off from your mouth. And that's exactly what they were drunk on, was that new wine. As they sat there talking in another language, dialect. Brothers and sisters, all of a sudden some of them got such a, an urge. Enthusiastic. I can't sit still. And boy, one by one they begin to get up and get out of there. I got to get out of here. And so the Spirit of God just roll them out of that upper room, into the streets. And here they come down them steps. Into the streets. Staggering, talking in another dialect. This is talking in one tongue, that is talking in another tongue, that is talking in something else. Here coming down the streets in the daylight hours, brothers, it's early in the morning, yeah, they're all going to the temple to take this, leave a of bread. I can see their hands loaded. And these street, this street's going to the temple, it's crowded. And here's the 120 beginning to come into the street, and they're heading one way, and these are going another way. But it creates a congestion. 
And all of a sudden, the whole crowd stops. And here's this 120 standing there talking and jabbering away in another dialect. All, each one different. But you know what? I can see some of these devout Jews, they're from Rome. They understand Latin. That's where they were born at. Here's some from Egypt, Coptic. All over the Mediterranean area, the old world area, from about 17 different nationalities of dialects, Jews have come for this one sacred occasion. It absolutely bothers It's the Feast of Pentecost that follows in the spring of the year right after the, the Passover Lambs Feast. And when these other Jews, these devout Jews, begin to hear these languages, they begin to say to one another, Do you understand what I hear? Yeah. Yeah. What is this? We go back to Isaiah 28. For precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept. Line upon line. Line upon line. Hear a little bit, and there a little bit. For the standing lips, and then above the tongue will I speak to this. Orthodox people. And yet for all of this, they will still not understand. But he spoke to them anyhow. And so what these, these devout Jews was, at what is, I hear the wonderful word of God of the word in the language where I was born. But here's the old Judean bunch at home. They didn't know all the language and other their own. They didn't understand a thing. To them, it was just a bunch of drunks jabbering away, lost their language. And the home bunch said this. These are not, uh, <coughs> these are just drunk of new wine. See, it's best the third hour of the day. See, it was early in the morning. The sun was coming up. It wasn't at midnight. And when they began to say that, accused them all being drunk, then he got to the place where Peter took it. <coughs> and that was his cue. Now here's where the keys are going to work. First time he's going to use the keys. I can just see him touch his heart and say, Lord, you just help me now to say the right thing. These are not drunk, as you suppose. Seems but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he began to use Joel as a basis for his text. And he gave them a revelation and a sermon there in a few short minutes. And at that time, there was a lot of these devout Jews that were getting under conviction because they were already hearing this through them other languages. And here's a man of Judea confirming it. And they begin to come around Peter because he's used the keys properly. Because the keys have went right into the, it's penetrated their heart. It's opened the door to their heart. And they said, well, what must we do then, brother? He said, repent every one of you. And be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children, to your children's children, even as many as our Lord our God shall call, even as many that are far off, and so on and so forth. So brothers and sisters, <coughs> that day there was 3,000 souls added. Then a few days later, brothers and sisters, it fell Peter's lot to speak and address another group of people and 5,000 more was baptized. So the Lord began to add to the church daily such as should be saved. Now then, <clears throat> let's get back here then to Corinthians. Paul is writing this to the Corinthian church. Now he begins to really instruct the Corinthian believers by saying, and he brings it to the present tense, but now is Christ risen from the dead. Now we must understand now, we've got to believe he has risen from the dead and become the, the first fruits. In other words, he was that sheep offering that went up first. A damn the sweat. For since by man, meaning Adam of old, came death. By man came also the resurrection of the dead, which is Christ. He's the second Adam. For 
Christ is an Adam, all die. That's a bull. Even so in Christ, the second Adam, shall all be made alive. But every man, but every man in his own order. Now Paul is stressing the redeemed first. Even so in Christ shall all be made alive, but every man in his own order, or time. Christ the first fruits, after they that are Christ as his coming. Now Paul at this point is looking ahead, pointing to the second coming. Now, let's take a look. Let's stop right there. Let's go back to Matthew's writing. Did Paul see what Matthew wrote of old? In the 27th chapter of Matthew, and is the only one that records it like this. Brother Davis, the other night when he was preaching, I thought he was going to get into this. He just brought it up to a certain point here. Now, I'm <clears throat> looking this morning. I'm in the 50th verse of the 27th chapter of Isaiah. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost, meaning his spirit life left him. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent. Now, brothers and sisters, the Jewish people today do not see this nor understand this. But when this happened, that was God's way of saying, the end of the law is come. He rent that temple veil. That meant from there on, God by his Shekinah glory never again will dwell behind that curtain. He's coming to dwell in here. That end of that old covenant, Jeremiah 31 begins the new covenant when I will come down and write them in their hearts and plant them in their minds. And I will come and dwell in them. That's why we said before. Under the law, God did not dwell in the people. He dwelt among them in first the tabernacle, then the temple, in all of them types. He made himself known. There was a manifestation of his Shekinah glory that had been seen. But men could only come at a, at a certain distance. And they worshipped him and served him in certain rituals around that. That showed he was among the people. But that law itself did not make them perfect. He did not take away their sins. That's why the Apostle Paul in the book of Hebrews says, for the blood of those that go did not take away sin. It only atones temporarily, pushing it constantly ahead. Till there's a day coming, yes, when there will be a Passover lamb come, whose blood, yes, once and for all has sanctified, redeemed, set aside the sins of mankind forever. So therefore, as we continue to read, so the veil was rent, entwined from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. In other words, brothers and sisters, there was rocks literally busted in two, taking the bluffs, rock bluffs around Jerusalem. And the graves were opened. Now I have to say, brothers and sisters, this event in itself, had to be of such magnitude that it became a noticeable thing by the general population of Jerusalem. They didn't understand it. But they could see something has happened. And I have to believe, brothers and sisters, some of these just normal Jews saw someone walking around that they had known in days gone by before they even died. 
If people are left ignorant of what's going on and don't see nothing other than they can identify it, they do not know how to talk in this manner. You would neither. You'd probably get scared and run. But with this, brothers and sisters, they knew that these were all dead people. And <clears throat> so as the graves were opened, now, Brother Jackson, does that mean that you go out there and you see a hole in the ground? Absolutely not. But when you see what's been buried in there, out here walking around, you know it got out of there somewhere or other, don't you? And the graves were opened. And many bodies of the saints which slept the rose. Many bodies. I have to say, they saw such a number of people walking around, there was no way they could count. But it was very evident. Something has happened from among the dead. And I have to say, brothers and sisters, it's right here where the Apostle Paul is going to get the beginning of his revelation. And still the, the Judaistic Jews today, the tombs are still there. They still go there year after year putting flowers on King David's tomb. While they've got crowns sitting up on a shelf right above his tomb. Ain't the brother out? <laughs> to them, he's still in there. Show on the day of I mean, in the book of Acts, they will tell you how, and he's tombed with us today. But I have to say, brothers and sisters, when we see what Paul says in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, He's not in that tomb. He was taken out of there. Now let's go on here. Alright. The graves were open and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city. Now brothers and sisters, according to the dimensions of the walls, as we've been told, the old city of Jerusalem covered the approximately of four square miles. That was just his population and dimensions in that ancient time. I have to say there were several hundred thousand people lived in there. And I have to say, to some of them, some of these saints that's walking around was known. It's got to be noticed, it's got to be something that was of such a major effect that they talked about it. Otherwise, Matthew would have never wrote it. Now the point is this. What has happened? Well, I'll have to say, brothers and sisters, we would be foolish to say that when they got to walking around, one of them seen to the other, well, come on, boys, let's go back. And so they went back out there and they laid back down in that old grave. What a story and a half. That was the beginning of something. Never happened before like that. So that's why, brothers and sisters, we have to believe there was a resurrection of Old Testament saints. Now the question can be asked, Brother Jackson, are you sure if they arose in Jerusalem, who would it be? Jews. But we're talking about saints that died before them, brothers and sisters. You're not even looking at Jerusalem. You're looking at all over the whole perimeter of the Middle East. Think of it before the flood. Think of people that lived then. Could you find where they're buried? No, you couldn't. So as saints in Jerusalem came forth from the graves, I have to say, across that whole biblical land, brothers and sisters, graves. That was not even known to the present generation of mankind of that hour at all. They came forth. They didn't have to come to Jerusalem. Because the object is, it was a Jerusalem where this thing is going to be recorded. And something is going to be said that's evident. That what happened there is the end of the law. Peace starts. And the church is going to be built now on a different foundation and a different revelation. All together. And our faith is in Christ the first fruit. After a day that our Christ. Now. <clears throat> let's go then.
to Ephesians. Here's where the Apostle Paul adds something other to this. In his writings here, I will pick up in the fifth verse, and then we will bring this to a close this morning. He says, there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There's one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all, by the Holy Ghost. But unto every one of us is given grace, God's imputed imputation of favor and grace to us, the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive. Now what's he talking about? Well, we do know this. When Jesus died on the cross, he cried with a loud voice, it's finished. He died and he went down into hell. Brother Jackson, did he really go to hell? He went to that part of paradise. What did he do, go, do that for? He went down there, brother and sister, to preach to the imprisoned spirits. And when he came forth, he brought all those righteous spirits out of hell. That ended that old dispensation of hell is where the righteous are held in paradise. Redemption. He's the Redeemer. He came to set the captive free. So, he overcomes hell in that respect. He has brought an end to sin in his flesh on the cross. For by one offering has he perfected forever them that are sanctified, set apart. So he releases them spirits. Now that he did. And who do you think these spirits come to? To their bodies. And some of them appeared in Jerusalem. The rest didn't have to appear in Jerusalem. It's irrelative to the revelation. But if Paul here is saying, now he that descended is the one that went down. And he descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same of also that is set up for above all heavens that he might fill all things. But in the 8th verse, when he is set it up on high, high, he led captivity, that's the souls in hell, in paradise, captive and gave gifts unto men. That's what he gave to the church on the day of Pentecost. He went up. Now, brothers and sisters, the point is this. Are we going to repudiate Paul's revelation here by saying, oh, or just a little handful. We've got people just that technical. They won't believe nothing unless you explain it right down to the last screw nut and bolt. Now that's my old hillbilly language way of expressing it. And some things, brothers and sisters, God don't get that technical with nobody. But the point of it is, if he conquered hell, and he led captivity captive. That emptied that place, didn't it? So I would say, well, he took some of the bodies up and left the rest later. All right, if that's the way you want to believe, go ahead and believe it that way. Now that takes you right back to 1 Corinthians. Christ the first fruit, so he rose from the dead. Afterward, that, they that are Christ at his coming. And I have to say, well, he rose from the dead. Three days later, these others came out. And them's the ones he took to glory with him. So some could say, well, but he took the spirits of some and he took them, others that's resurrected. Well, we might run into trouble when we get into glory, brothers and sisters, and see all of this begin to unfold. So but the point is this, brothers and sisters, like Brother Allen was said when we were talking on some other subject back here weeks ago, think of that thief that hung on that cross and that thief looked across at him. And that thief over there, he had ridiculed her with a bunch of negative words. And asking this thief over here, why don't you say something other? And this thief over here, all he could say, he just looked over at his Savior and Master. He said, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. I can see that man in so much pain and so much anguish. He's ashamed to be a hanging there 
in the presence of such a man as this that that on every bunch down there has crucified. He said, Master, just remember me. And Jesus gave him these comfort word, comforting words. This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. Well, Jesus went to paradise first, didn't he? And the thief went with him. And the thief heard him say his angel down there was imprisoned. But I have to say, brothers and sisters, did he leave him down there? No, he didn't. Amen. He brought him back out there with him. Amen. And all that others that he brought out. So we can say this, in the flesh of Jesus Christ, hell was to put overcome by the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. And he took out of there. And boy, you want to strengthen that and swallow a camel. There were some mortal bodies, I mean immortal bodies to come out of there and walk in the streets of Jerusalem that never went out there and got back down in the graves. When Jesus ascended on high, they went up with him. And they're in glory today. So now, <clears throat> tonight, the Lord willing, we want to finish this up. We'll see how Paul looked at this. Then we'll see why John says what he did in the book of Revelations. May God bless you. I understand we're having a baptism this morning. Heavenly Father, take these words today. Lord, it's your grace and mercy that's made us anything. I humbly pray, Lord, that you will bless every heart, every soul. Bless the one that's about to be baptized and buried in your name, Lord. We thank you today for your mercy and grace and goodness now. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Brother Keith Williams, Sister Lori's daughter, she comes here just with a desire to fulfill the scripture and to walk with the Lord. So let's just look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do come into thy presence and we are grateful today for the blessings that you have given to us. Now here, Lord, stands this young sister with a desire, Lord, to walk with you, to be baptized in Christian baptism. We ask you, Father, that you would take her now from this watery grave. May you just lead her by your spirit. May you guide her upon her journey. And may you just help her to walk close to thee and to realize, Lord, that Really, you're the only way that there is to go. May you just strengthen her from day to day now and multiply your spirit within her life. We commit her to you in that precious name, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. All right, Bethany. As it's recorded in Acts chapter 2, verse 38 and throughout the scripture, I baptize you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for the remission of all of your sins. Hey. Hey.